The Orthodox Network presents Awareness and Education, Opioid Addiction and Emerging Issue in the Chicagoland Orthodox Jewish Communities, presented on Monday, November 5, 2018, at the Abe and Ida Cooper Center, 6639 North Kedzie Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, Jewish Child and Family Services. All right, good morning. I feel like just to play with everybody, we should move the podium to back. Good morning. I feel like just to play with everybody, we should move the podium to that side of the room. Um, okay, my name is Mark Suarez. I am the executive director of the ARC. And on, half of the, on behalf of the entire planning committee, I'd like to welcome you all as Jewish communal professionals and rabbis and other leaders to the Orthodox uh, Network's Awareness and Education Forum. Our topic this morning is opioid addiction and emerging, an emerging issue in the Chicagoland Orthodox Jewish communities. We're all acutely aware that right now Jews are struggling with issues of intolerance and hate from those external to our communities, uh, the issues of what happened in Pittsburgh and right here in Rogers Park are certainly foremost in our minds um, pretty much constantly these days. And what we're talking about this morning is almost equally as, as distressing as those various public and disturbing events. But it's so much more insidious and maybe even dangerous because it's an issue that comes at us from the inside, inside of our homes and our schools and our shoals and our neighborhoods. Everyone here, I know, we all work in Jewish communal institutions and we're dedicated to tikkun olam and chesed to caring and compassion. And while we may not be the hundreds of thousands of people who turn out for these candlelight vigils, um, we are those who are dedicated quietly, working on the inside, to do something about the hushed up challenges facing our community, um, like opioid addiction. So right from the outset, I want to thank all of you for taking the time out this morning to join us. The Orthodox Network is a collaboration of Jewish agency social service providers who work together in partnership to provide services for the Orthodox community in metropolitan Chicago. The purpose of these forums is to raise awareness and understanding around some of the issues experienced uh, by communal professionals working directly within Orthodox Jewish communities. It's hard to believe, but this is our 11th such forum. Our sponsoring agencies and organizations this morning include Jewish, Jewish Child and Family Services, and we're grateful to them for hosting us this morning as they have all of our forums. Other sponsors include CJE Senior Life, JCC Chicago, The Ark, Shalva, No Shame on You, the Jewish Neighborhood Development Council of Chicago, Nefesh Chicago, High Lifeline, and our first time partner, Madregos. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first and more, most importantly, I want to thank you again for joining us this morning. We're thrilled and honored that you made time for us. The food in the back is for everyone. Please help yourselves during our speakers, we all watch us, you know, make the food go away. Uh, there are CEUs available this morning. Marilyn Siegel, who's sitting right here in the middle, will take care of that in the back of the room for you after the program. There are, uh, do we have evaluation forms? Yes, Jeff is going to bring them in in a minute. Okay, we have evaluation forms coming in just in a minute. Well, we actually use those evaluation forms and take them very seriously. I'll talk about them briefly at the end. But please um, fill them out. We, we, need your, um, we need your input so that we can continue to plan in future forums. A few thank yous. We want to thank or Laura O'Lear and the staff here at the Abe and Ida Cooper Center for making this beautiful space available to us once again. Thank you to the members of the Orthodox Network. Many of you are here. Um, and to, in particular to the Forum Planning Committee. Our chairs of the Orthodox Network are Marilyn Siegel and David Rosenberg, uh, Rabbi David Rosenberg. Nothing that we do would happen without their leadership and um, hard work. And of course, I want, and Lance, want to thank all of our presenters this morning. Um, who will be sharing their insights and experiences with us shortly. The Cooper Center is a secure facility, so if you need to leave the room, go to the bathroom, or for any reason step out, there are pass cards right there in the corner next to the computer. Take, be sure to take one of those so you can get back in. Uh, the schedule for the morning this morning is like this. I'm going to speak right now. When I'm done, Ed Lowe is going to introduce our panelists and moderate the forum. Um, then there'll be a question and answer um, period at the end and some time for networking following that. Okay, introduce the topic. So we're very excited this morning to explore the topic of opioid addiction, an emerging issue in Chicagoland Orthodox Jewish communities. We have four explicit goals for this morning. 
First is to expand our knowledge of opioid and opioid addiction. Second is to develop a deeper awareness in, of how opioid addiction impacts the Orthodox Jewish community. Third is to get some practical information about the services and resources available to those struggling with opioid addictions. And finally, it's to develop a deeper understanding of how we as communal professionals can respond to those experiencing an addiction. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Ed Lowe, Assistant Director of the NAP Counseling Center, who will introduce our panelists. There he is. And even though I have a loud, booming voice, I was told I need to use the microphone, so I will. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us once again. Um, so our first speaker today is uh, Beth Fishman, Dr. Beth Fishman, um, bringing a unique perspective of addiction recovery through Jewish tradition. Beth Fishman has worked with individuals and families impacted by a wide range of substance abuse disorders and other addictive behaviors for over 25 years. Dr. Fishman is the manager of the Jewish Center for Addiction at Jewish Child and Family Services of Chicago, where she offers education and support to Chicagoland Jews in recovery and training for treatment professionals, as we are earlier this morning. She assists Jewish communities in developing programs to address addiction and help synagogues to create safe, sacred space vis-a-vis -vis alcohol use. Dr. Fishman is, a licen is licensed as a clinical psychologist by the state of Illinois. Dr. Fishman. Good morning. I see a lot of familiar faces. Very nice, and also some new ones. I look forward to meeting new folks. And said he has a loud, booming voice. I have the opposite, so the microphone is required for me. Um, so I'm going to spend just a few minutes giving a broad overview and introduction to opioids in general. As just mentioned, I'm the director of the Jewish Center for Addiction, Jewish Child and Family Services, and our services, if you aren't familiar with us, include a community education on addiction, professional training such as this. We offer youth drug prevention programming through a Jewish lens, through synagogue youth uh, groups, and also at Jewish day schools. We field between 100 and 200 information and referral calls every year from community members who are struggling with addiction or have questions and we find resources for them. And we also offer workshops and events for those who are impacted by addiction. Um, and uh, for an example, we have a Hanukkah event on December 6th at Rochelle Zell Jewish High School. So everyone is welcome to that. And we are supported by the Fund for Innovation and Health at Federation as well as the Delighter and Winston Foundations. So I titled this presentation, The Monster in the Medicine Cabinet. Why am I saying the monster? <coughs> there are no shortage of terrifying statistics around opioids in our country these days. So here's just uh, a handful. For example, since the year 2000, opioid overdose deaths have increased fourfold. Drug overdose deaths in general, meaning all drugs, the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S., and that includes car accidents, gun violence, anything. So drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death now in our country. And of those overall drug overdose deaths, opioid misuse accounts for nearly 75% of the accidental deaths. And unfortunately, the situation is not resolving at all. We're not even plateauing yet. Approximately 42,000 Americans died in 2016 of all drug overdoses, and that estimate was 72,000 uh, overdose deaths last year, so as you see, an in, a huge increase. And of those 72,000 overdose deaths, approximately 50,000 were affiliated with opioid use. And of those 50,000, approximately 30,000 were affiliated with fentanyl use, and we'll talk a little bit more about fentanyl later. It's not just the individuals who are using opioids themselves that are impacted, obviously, because I think we probably all know, all of us in this room, that families are deeply impacted by addiction. And here are some examples of how we know this is the case with uh, opioid use. So in 2011, um, a group called the Addicts Mom was founded by a woman who lost her young adult son to heroin overdose. Uh, she founded a Facebook group that has 77,000 followers now. And there is an affiliated private group that one can join that is affiliated with that open Facebook group, and there are 33,000 members of the private 
group, the Addicts Mom. There's a much more recently founded group called Grandparents Raising Grandchildren, February 2016. And this is specifically for the very large numbers of grandparents who are raising their grandchildren because the intermediate generation there is, is absent, either dead from overdose, imprisoned because of their drug use, or in other ways unable to care for their children um, and the children were experiencing neglect. There is a group called GRASP. There is a chapter in our Northwest suburbs. I want to get the acronym correct. Grief Recovery After a Substance Passing. It was founded in 2002 by parents who, again, had lost their young adult child to overdose, to opiate overdose. And there are now 98 chapters around the country of GRASP. And there's been a 338% increase in neonatal abstinence syndrome during this time period. That's basically when a mother has been using opioids during her pregnancy and the child is born addicted to opioids and the syndrome is basically the infant going through withdrawal um, and being helped medically through that very painful, difficult process. So the monster has many names and it's important that we know what we're talking about because in this case we're primarily talking about pain medication and there's lots of different pain medications that are opioids and we may be familiar with the, the names and not realize that this is an opioid that we're talking about. So officially, there are two terms, opiates and opioids. And officially, opiates are the natural products of the poppy plant. Opioids are officially the synthetic versions. These days, the two terms are often used interchangeably, but officially, opiates, which are the natural products, are morphine, codeine, and heroin. And the opioids, the synthetics, which we recognize as the prescription pain pills, I'm sure these names, some of which will be familiar to you, Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, Dilaudid, Lortab, and then I'm going to mention separately fentanyl and carfentanil, because these two synthetic opioids are um, so astronomically more dangerous than the others because they are so much more potent. You may have heard in the news last year and several months ago, there were some widespread police, or some widespread reporting on some incidents with first responders and police who accidentally, by being um, on the scene, got some fentanyl or carfentanil on their skin just by being at the scene of an overdose. And because of having gotten a few little pieces of these very, very potent substances, in contact with their skin were beginning to experience overdose and had to be taken to the hospital. <clears throat> it's very, very uh, dangerous. The reason that there's so much fentanyl involved in accidental overdose is because it's being cut into heroin on a regular basis now. And so when somebody who is using heroin um, and has a pretty uh, good idea, as most folks who use do, how much they can use um, relatively mm -hmm. safely, so to speak, without overdosing, they may buy a batch of heroin thinking that they know what they're getting, but it's cut with fentanyl or carfentanil, which is extraordinarily dangerous, and they take what they think is their usual amount, yet it's not what they think, and therefore accidental overdose happens. So how do opioids actually cause overdose? In a variety of ways, but primarily through suppressing breathing. Uh, in the brain stem. So respiratory distress and then the cessation of breathing is often deadly. Additionally though, the gag reflex can be suppressed. And very, very often folks are using opioids in addition to alcohol or other sedatives. So they may be very groggy um, or they may have used a little more than they expected to and so they may be um, on the floor, they may be reclining, and if they are and they vomit, it's easy to aspirate the vomit and die if the gag reflex is being suppressed. Lastly, opioids also can trigger an abnormal heart rhythm, which for some people is very, very dangerous and in itself can be fatal. So how did we get to this point where we have 72,000 American deaths and um, so many of those related to opioids. So in the 1990s, there was a very unfortunate, what I'm calling perfect storm of events that happened. The first was that physicians began to experience 
a tremendous amount of pressure to do a better job of controlling pain in their patients. And in one way this was really good because now we know very clearly that good pain control is important for healing. It's very difficult to heal in a smooth and natural way if there's an enormous amount of pain. So it's good that attention was brought to the fact that pain needed to be controlled better. Some of why there was so much pressure maybe isn't so good, because physicians were beginning to be rated by patients, the rating scales of their satisfaction, and the patients who were experiencing more pain uh, tended to rate their physicians more poorly. Whether or not that's warranted or not, that was basically the experience. And hospital administrators were pretty uncomfortable with that, and physicians were getting some blowback about getting poor ratings from their patients. So there's a lot of pressure in a variety of ways for physicians to do a better job of pain control. Unfortunately, because of the way our health care works, physicians were still under that like 15, 10 or 15 minute pressure to uh, see clients very, very quickly, as I know we've probably all experienced as patients. So the easiest way to deal with pain when you have 15 minutes with a client or a patient is to prescribe a pill. So there wasn't nearly as much emphasis on pain control with alternative um, means through chiropractic and massage and yoga and all the other ways that we know, acupuncture, but primarily focusing on pills. Okay, so physicians were very motivated to prescribe. At the same time, probably not by accident, a lot of new opioid pain medications were being produced, synthetic pain medications were being produced, and in particular in the case of OxyContin, being very deceptively marketed to physicians. We now know that Purdue Pharma, which produced OxyContin, knew that there was a very high addictive profile for OxyContin, very, very high. But it was marketed to physicians as if it was completely safe, that there was very little risk. So this was a great relief to physicians because a lot of patients come in with a lot of pain, a lot of pressure to control that pain. Oh, and here's a new drug that works without uh, significant side effects. So this was seen as a, a great relief and lots and lots and lots of OxyContin and other similar pain medications were being prescribed. So there was an absolute flood of pain medication in our country at that time and since. And around the same time, heroin production moved to Mexico. Most heroin before then had been produced in places like Afghanistan, far away, which makes it more expensive to deliver the drug to the United States. And if it's more expensive to transport, then it's more expensive to purchase. When heroin began to be produced in Mexico, our neighbor, right, the price dropped. And we in Chicago are the Midwest distribution hub for Mexican heroin. So certainly in Chicago, but all over the country, the price of heroin is very low and the supply is very, very high. It's very easy to get. So all of these three together created a terrible situation and we've seen the opioid epidemic because of it. But how does one get from using prescription pills to wanting and needing this easy access to Mexican-produced heroin? So physicians are prescribing, as I just mentioned. And because I think physicians were feeling so safe in prescribing these medications that supposedly had no addictive profile, they were prescribing pretty large quantities, like way more than were necessary. So if somebody went in, we hear this a lot for uh, wisdom tooth extraction, and this happens often, right, for young adults, teenagers and young adults. They might get a month's worth of opioids. They might go back, back home with a big, big bottle of OxyContin or similar, when maybe three days' worth is needed, if that. So there's a, either a whole lot of OxyContin or similar in somebody's medicine, in lots of people's medicine cabinets, not just somebody's, or the person thought, the patient thought, oh, I got 30 days worth, I guess I better use it, I guess I need it. Because they weren't getting the patient education they needed because the physicians thought it was safe. Okay. Also, pain medication prescriptions are being written for more than just the acute pain that um, opioid pain medication is best for. So lots of chronic pain was being treated sort of somewhat inappropriately with uh, opioid pain medications. So somebody takes their 30 days worth even though they don't need it, by then they're, they're pretty well and addicted to the pain medication, and they, they need a supply. They're all out, 30 days is gone. They may go back to the original prescribing doctor, but the doctor at that point, hopefully, says, you don't need it anymore, no, sorry. Um, and so they go looking for other sources, which can be somebody else's medicine cabinet, if not their own, so the grandparents and the friends, and 
or they may start doctor shopping, going to another physician. Um, and that was very, very easy to do. When those supplies ran out and the person is still addicted and they need their fix, then where do you go? You go to the street. It is possible to purchase prescription pain medicine uh, on the street, but it's extremely expensive. It can be $25 a pill, $30 a pill, and somebody who has a habit needs more than one pill a day, so that becomes very expensive very quickly. So the other alternative then is this widely available and very cheap heroin, which has virtually the same effect in the body. And that's how so many people in this epidemic go from their initially rightfully prescribed pain medication to ending up a heroin addict. So lastly, how do we defeat this monster, this opioid monster? Thankfully, and really quite recently, a number of steps have been taken that have been advantageous. Clearly, we're not defeating the monster yet, but at least we're moving in the direction of having some more tools. Uh, be surprised if most of us haven't heard about Narcan or Naloxone, which all first responders are now carrying for, for reversing overdose, and it's so important. Some people think that it's uh, an ethical issue, should you keep giving Narcan to somebody who keeps overdosing, but certainly I say yes, that's my vote, because if you save that life, even if you have to save it 20 times, the 21st time may be when they get into recovery. So saving the life, obviously, from a Jewish perspective as well, is always the priority. Drug diversion programs are growing rapidly, and there's a relatively new one in the last two years in Lake County that's just taken off like wildfire. It's called A Way Out where most of the police precincts in Lake County are participating. If a drug um, misuser is wanting to get some help, this person can go into one of the police departments that are participating in the A Way Out program, can bring his or her drugs with, uh, as well, along with the equipment used to use the drugs, hand it over to the police and say, I want help. They will not be prosecuted, the drugs will be taken, the equipment will be taken, and they will be directed immediately from the police station to a treatment center. It's been wildly um, successful and is being copied, in fact, around the country. That person never goes before the court at that time, and, and hopefully in future they're in recovery and, and uh, will never face court. Medication-assisted treatment has been around for a long time. I'm sure you're familiar with methadone, which has been used at least since the 60s for uh, opioid use at that time. But there are new medications that are uh, more readily available because methadone has to be um, given out at a clinic, which makes it inconvenient or really difficult for some people to obtain. Suboxone is similar, um, a newer drug, which physicians can prescribe out of their own offices. It helps with cravings. It also helps to um, deny the high of illicit drug use. So it really has been very, very effective in helping people stay in early recovery. And lastly, prescription monitoring programs, which are in the majority of states now. So in this case, all drugs of this sort are registered when they're prescribed. So if somebody comes into a physician's office and says, I have pain, I need opioid pain medication, the physician can check to see if this person has recently been prescribed similar medication, and therefore the doctor shopping can stop and more informed decisions around prescribing can happen. And these all are having an effect, not yet the effect that we need, but these and other tools which will be developed hopefully will get us on top of this terrible epidemic that we're experiencing. So this is how to reach me, but if you have any questions, come on up to me afterwards. Thank you so much for your attention, and we'll turn it over to the rest of the panel. Okay, our next, our next presenter is Mimi Seleski. Um, Mimi is an RN MPH and she is the clinical manager of the medical, dental, and eye clinics at the ARC, a social service agency located on Chicago's north side. <clears throat> In addition to standard medical and dental care, these clinics include optometry, ophthalmology, free glasses, and free pharmacy services. Last year, 977 people received one or more services from the ARC's clinics. Prior to her service at the ARC, Mimi Seleski worked in a family business and as a public health nurse for the Council for the Jewish Elderly, now known as CJE Senior Life. Mrs. Seleski graduated from Loyola University as an RNBSN and from the University of Illinois Chicago as an MPH. 
She served as the co-editor of Diagnosis Management and Treatment of Dementia, a Practical Guide for Primary Care Physicians through the AMA 2000. Mimi Selesky lives in West Rogers Park with her family. Mimi? Hi. My perspective is as the clinical manager of the ARC. So I see what happens in the ARC, and I'll describe it to you, too. Um, it's important to know that the ARC has been running medical clinics for over 45 years. It was founded as a medical clinic, and opioids have been part of medical practice for the entire time. This has never changed. It's always been there. So I'm going to start with a couple of true stories. Mina is a waitress. She fell and she broke her kneecap several years ago. She also has documented arthritis and other medical problems. She works six days a week in eight to 10 hour shifts. Mina hurts when she wakes up, she hurts when she works, and she really hurts at the end of her shift. She makes just over the cap for Medicaid and can't afford to buy insurance, so Mina comes to the ARC for care. Story number two, Eddie has been a patient of the ARC for many years. Among other problems, he has rheumatoid arthritis. His feet look like this, like this. He works as a stock person at Bed Bath & Beyond. Blankets, pillows, clocks, dishes, whatever needs moving, he moves it. Eddie was uninsured for many, many years and developed his illness prior to the advent of all those drugs you see on TV to control rheumatoid arthritis. Eddie hurts, he just hurts every day. These two patients have problems that challenge us every day. In a medical clinic, especially one like the ARC where the pharmacist is part of the healthcare team, there are safeguards in place to help us determine if a patient is following a doctor's orders. Did this just shut off? Did I do that? It did it, okay. Well, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, to help us determine if he's following doctor's orders with regards to painkillers. So the first thing we have, which Beth mentioned, is the State of Illinois Prescription Monitoring Program that tells us where a patient is getting legal prescribed opioids and other drugs similar to that from other practitioners outside of the ARC. It's actually a pharmacy tool that is used by both pharmacists and doctors to watch legal opioid prescription use. It lists the date the doctor, the date purchased, the type of medication that the patient received in a given month. So we can quickly see if a patient has made a trip to another clinic and got a prescription from someplace else. Prescriptions also have to be handwritten for one month duration only to prevent misuse, abuse. Okay. Um, the ARC requests medical records from past doctors, from patients, to understand the past medical history. Is there a history of opioid or other substance abuse? What does the medical history say about pain? Is there a history of accidents or other problems that necessitate emergency room visits or painkillers? It can signal for us some drug-seeking behavior. We can set up a patient on a controlled substance contract to help the patient work on keeping the use of painkillers within reason. We often use these contracts when trying to wean a patient down from high levels of prescription painkillers. The contract says that the patient will not get opioid drugs from any other place besides the ARC without letting us know. And we have the documentation to, to check on it. Finally, we can refer a patient to a pain management clinic if possible. Is it working now? If possible, um, depends on their insurance Medicaid, lots of factors go into that, and not all, it's not always possible for patients of the ARC. So I'm going to go just to drop off topic, but I think it's worth mentioning how things work. The medical department of the ARC consists of the medical clinic, the dental, and the eye care clinic. In the medical department, we use a service approach we call integrated care. We use our medical and dental facilities in tandem to improve the health of patients. For example, as the clinical manager and the nurse, I review all the medical history forms that come into dentistry of at-risk patients prior to their seeing the dentist. I highlight any problems that could impact dental services. I note which patients are taking opioid or any other painkiller drugs for the dentist, so he's aware of this. It can affect how a person takes to anesthesia and dental procedures and certainly affects care after dental procedures. 
I also request written letters from patients' doctors with specific instructions for pre- and post-care and dental procedures. Case managers at the ARC can check on who will take care of the patient at home following a procedure. And sometimes patients need emotional support to follow through with dental care, and the case managers work with families to provide that care. We implemented these procedures to improve patient outcomes following dental care. The old model was to give the patient 10 tablets of a powerful painkiller and call it a day. Those days are gone, as doctors are now extremely judicious in giving out pain medicines, and this actually works so much better for the patient. These are very, very helpful modalities in a medical clinic. They help us determine if someone's in pain, is an addict, or both at the same time. In addition, we do the same types of things you do when working with a person with any challenging problem. We listen. We listen and really hear as much as we can. We find that some patients tell us exactly why they came and what they want if we listen carefully in a judgment-free zone. We listen how the patient asks for something. Did they come in to tell us about their ailment or did they come in to ask for a prescription first? It's important. We ask a lot of questions. If a story is not adding up and I get one plus one equal three, we need to ask more questions before we do anything. It's not being nosy, it's not being intrusive, it's being careful. We review a lot of past history. We get key information about past illnesses and behaviors by reviewing anything we have, past notes, charts, whatever we can get our hands on. Using these tools, we develop a clinical picture of a person. At the ARC, we work as a team with the case management staff to devise plans of action. Sometimes it does include painkiller medications. We find, using our best judgment, that if a patient is seeking painkillers that are not appropriate to their clinical picture, we say, sorry, no. We may offer the other programs, clinics, places for the patient to seek care. Each patient's an individual, and we figure out the best plan that we can for that person. Other things I've learned along the way that help me work with all the different types of people that we see at the ARC. Every interaction, including saying hi in the hallway, is a therapeutic interaction. Be mindful of what you say and how you say it, and I've certainly learned that the hard way. Communicate with staff and any others in that patient's life and work with those people. Make sure you are all on the same page. Know your capabilities, and that we try to do. Don't take on what you cannot fix. So, back to my patients. Eddie maintains his schedule, actually, of painkilling drugs without fail every month. He goes to work as often as he can. Mina signed a, pain, a treatment contract, but was unable to fulfill the terms of the contract. She sought painkillers in other venues in the same month without informing us. She's no longer able to receive painkillers in the ARC. This was a crisis for Mina, who needed a lot of counseling. However, interestingly enough, Mina is also a recovering alcoholic who understood addiction and its consequences. She actually rethought the direction she wanted to take in her life. After a while, she requested and received permission to see an orthopedic specialist through the ARC. With his help, she now takes no painkillers and is feeling much better, much less pain. When I started working at the ARC, I was privileged to spend one day a week with the founder of the ARC, Dr. Sokol. He's been retired for a number of years, but I never forgot the lessons he taught me. He treated each patient with kindness and respect. <coughs> these two attributes kept patients coming back to him. I think about that these days when the world seems so uncertain. If we continue to treat others with kindness and respect, we too can heal our patients in our world, one by one. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> okay. Our next presenter is Yankee Greenberger. 
um, who is the clinical director of Madregos Midwest. After spending three years studying in Israel, Yankee graduated from Tura College with a major in psychology. He continued his education at the Wurzweiler School of Social Work and earned his master's in social work. After three years of successful work at the Tova Mentoring Program, in which he became a supervisor, Yankee took his skills, training, and experience working with teenagers um, to the Yatsan Center, then in Mount Vernon, New York. The Yatsan Center was a drug and alcohol rehabilitation treatment facility servicing Jewish adolescents from around the world. Yankee was a primary counselor of the program and engaged the residents in individual therapy as well as group therapy. In August of 2006, Yankee moved to Los Angeles to become the clinical director of adolescent services of H. Tamid of Los Angeles. He played a vital role with all the H. Tamid programming and services, including designing and developing Pardes Academy and H. Tamid's Teen Drop-In Center. Yankee was also the school-based therapist in Eula Boys High School for Alenu. Additionally, he was on the Board of Behavioral Sciences, registered associate clinical social worker in the state of California. Yankee and his family moved to Chicago in August of 2009 upon accepting the position of clinical director of Madregos Midwest. He is responsible for the oversight of all clinical and programming services of Madregos, including assessing and evaluating cases of teens and young adults, providing support, referrals, case management, therapeutic mentoring, prevention programs, and crisis intervention. He brings his experience of establishing and running effective recreational programming and implements those principles in Madrigal's Midwest. Yankee, the microphone is yours. I'm also an avid Mets fan. Does there anything else you want to know about me? I'm a very open person. Um, so this topic of, uh, of opiate... Um, addiction and the emergence in the, in the Orthodox community is something that I'm uh, very passionate about. Um, I think also the, the title of this topic is, is perfect. I remember the last time I was asked to join this uh, network, I, had, I took a little bit of uh, issue with the title and I kind of revamped my presentation based off the title, but this one I think is perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, the reason why I'm, I'm very passionate about this, I remember when I was starting off my career um, I would hear more seasoned therapists tell me about um, going through their phones to try to call someone and, and coming across names of people that, that are no longer with us. And that, that always kind of stuck with me. Now I find myself going through my phone and finding names of people that are no longer with us. Um, and, you know, I, I, and when I speak on this, on this topic, I like to speak in, in, in their memory. I like to, and, and sometimes you know, we hear the statistics, we hear the numbers, but we don't really put um, names to it. And, I, and I'd like to just mention a couple of the names that uh, I've had the privilege to um, encounter in my name. And, and I speak in the memory of, of Yehuda, uh, Yehuda M and, and Yehuda G, of Zevi, of Todd, of Shua, of Moshe, um, of um, Aaron, of Ori, of Yis, and Rob, and Brian. So what's going on in Chicago? That's, um, I'm going to come from that perspective of what's, what's going on in Chicago. And um, what's going on on the East Coast and even on the, on the West Coast, the tri-state area, certainly is a lot more profound um, in terms of the epidemicness of it than what's happening here in Chicago. Um, it's completely out of control in, in, um, in the tri-state area. But that being said, you know, are there young adults that I'm afraid that I'm going to hear devastating news at any, at any minute? Are there those who I pray for every day? And the answer is yes. There are adults, both married and unmarried, who struggle with um, opiate addiction. And there are a number of teens who have already progressed to opiate use in, in their journey. So make no mistake about the need for this discussion here in, in Chicago, and I think it's great that the Orthodox Network has put this together. You know, we, did, we, did some, uh, we, we marketed this presentation on our Facebook page, and someone asked me, you know, should we talk about this? Should we talk about this? Doesn't it make it worse if we talk about this? And at first, I was like, what are you, crazy? Of course we need to talk about it. You know, so I, I took a step back and I, I thought about it, and the truth is, like, sometimes when we talk about things, it does make something worse. But, you know, I, I, you know, I'll tell you, what, you know, when I, when I think about the, you know, the, the media coverage of these school shootings that happen, 
I don't think there's any real benefit of kind of like, you know, really, you know, focusing so much attention on a school student because of all these copycat um, cases that happen. It's a great way for, you know, kids who are struggling, who are really disturbed to, you know, to kind of get themselves out there. And they, you know, the flash shooter made a, you know, recorded a video of himself before. So I, you know, I, I certainly on that level there there is, but the, the the difference between addiction is that addiction has always been around. Some commentaries will even say it goes, it dates back to the times of Noah, all right? Um, so addiction is something that's always been around, and us talking about it just creates a little bit more awareness and, and the opportunity for people to seek treatment when they need it. So, you know, at Madrigos we work with teens, and over the years. You kind of you kind of get a sense of where some kids are heading, and some that certainly surprise you as 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 uh, as they grow up. You know, and, and and I was looking at some statistics that kind of really I want to like focus my my remarks around. In 2016, uh, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, surveyed seniors. And the use of illicit drugs other than marijuana all declined among seniors just 2016, two years ago, um, other than marijuana. And it declined to, this, to the lowest level in the history of this survey. But they also found that there was a general decline in the perceived risk of the harm and the disapproval of using marijuana. So it's interesting. Every other drug dropped to its lowest level of use, except for marijuana which kind of stayed the same and in some cases uh, raised a little bit. And, and there was a decline in the perceived risk of using the drugs and the disapproval of it. And in states where medical marijuana are legal, there's a lot more, uh, there's about six percentage points more um, marijuana use amongst high schoolers than in states where medicinal marijuana is not legal. So I'm not talking about recreational. There are states now that are legalizing marijuana on a recreational level. I'm not even talking about those. Just states that um, medical marijuana was, was um, legalized. And in 2013, they found that more high school seniors regularly smoked pot than smoked cigarettes. Um, about 23% of high school seniors were smoking pot, and only 16% were smoking cigarettes, and in 2016 they updated that they updated that uh, study and found that there was a similar result in, that included e-cigs. So the popular e-cigarettes were actually being used less than pop amongst high school seniors. So you take all this information, and then you look at a, you look at two other statistics that have come out. One by the um, AARP that found that heroin addiction amongst young adults between the ages 18 and 25 doubled in the past 10 years. Doubled in the past 10 years. And according to SAMHSA, uh, they, they, uh, the, the study that they did found that it increased actually 60%. So, so you have, so you have this, this message of how pot is not so bad. And you know, it reminds me of, it reminds me of um, when I was in school, growing up in a, in a, in a yeshiva in Borough Park. Um, don't judge me. So, um, there, was, there was this program called TV Busters. Don't watch TV. Don't watch TV. And now, with the advent of the internet, go watch TV, just don't go on the internet. <laughs> right? So, I almost feel like that's kind of happened here, subliminally at least, where, you know what? Smoke pot, just don't do the others. Don't do don't do the other stuff, right? Go drink, just don't do the other stuff. And and according to both the AA, uh, the AARP and SAMHSA, that is clearly clearly not working. This idea that if we legalize pot, it'll decriminalize it. It'll it'll uh, it'll, it'll it'll be overall it'll be a better picture. So I just wanted to paint that 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 falsehood that it's not going to make things better. And I'm actually kind of curious to see after 10 years of what, what, what the stats look like once they start legalizing recreational use in Colorado and California just this past year. The other scary um, statistic that was uh, in, in, I think, one of the similar studies that I saw in 2013 was that um, teenagers that smoked pot or drank alcohol before the age of 18 were four times more likely to develop 
a substance abuse addiction than if they had done those things for the first time after 18 years old. So clearly the brain is in its formation, it's still developing, it's still going through its, its process of kind of getting to its, its, its optimal level. So those who smoke pot or drink before the age of 18 versus those who smoke after the age of 18 um, result in four times more likely um, to develop an addiction. So what can we do? I guess I'm going to take that tactic. What can we do? So we talk about prevention. We talk about the idea of let's get out there and, and recreate the message that pot and alcohol isn't all right. It, it, there are going to be some really detrimental effects to pot and alcohol. And, I, and, and in my opinion, just from observing some of the messaging going on, you know, certainly, certainly with alcohol, I think there's a certain lax attitude towards alcohol over the last several years, certainly in, in, uh, in the yeshiva systems. And I think that really has to be, for a while though, it was kind of heading in the right direction. But I think now, over the last number of years, it's really been something that's concerning. And I think we have to get back to realizing that you know, that attitude of, you know, just do this so you don't do that doesn't work. I think we have to find ways of really creating a message of, of meaning and purpose for kids to be able to achieve their, their, their optimal goals and, and in, in life um, other than drugs. So we talk about prevention. And when I say prevention, I don't mean scare tactics, because I, I know that scare tactics don't work. Um, and, and data and awareness for those who are truly at risk of, of, uh, of dependency and, and, and uh, addiction only goes so far. I think data and awareness is important for a lot of people. A lot of kids, you know, they appreciate the data, they appreciate the, the awareness, but it only goes so far. And I'll tell you what I mean. There was recently, I was talking to a group of kids and the the topic of like drinking on you know Friday night and own eggs and th that that whole idea came up, um, and unfortunately uh, um, a couple of years ago I think it was a couple of years now there was there was an incident up in uh, in Muncie where there was an own egg and someone drank and and passed out and and choked on his vomit while he was sleeping and, and died. Um, so you know that kind of came in to the to the discussion. We're talking about you know some of these risks, and a couple of the kids kind of looked at each other, laughed, and goes, "Yeah, that's why we wear backpacks when we drink." What? Yeah. So if you're wearing a heavy backpack, if you f pass out, you'll kind of like either be pushed up or you'll kind of roll over. So that's why we wear backpacks when we drink. <laughs> Creative. So. So. Um, so I think data and awareness goes so far. I think, there, I think the, what needs to happen is there needs to be a focus on life direction, goals, and values. And, and, and you know, uh, Mrs. Berkowitz here, Sherry Berkowitz, who's the director of our school-based prevention programs, um, you know, there's, there's, there, there, she shared um, this great group that I've run in a couple of yeshivas, even in, in, uh, in Gizbark and Skoki Sheva, which is always... Um, Gone out, gone over very well. In 11th grade, we interview. We kind of said, you know, what, what are your goals? We're starting 11th grade. It's actually one of the first groups you do in, in, with the 11th graders. Um, you're in 11th grade. You're not an underclassman anymore. You're starting your upperclassman years. You know, you have to shift from I'm a kid. So I got to start getting responsible. 11th grade is a massive year of college. Uh, or we'll really look at those. Are, are at those grades the last opportunity to really raise your GPA? It's, a, it's an important year. So where do you want to be in, in a number of years? And, you know, you kind of go around and get a sense of where people want to be. Of course, there are a couple of the wisecracks that, that say they want to be a drug addict, right? So we kind of just ignore that. Um, but most of them kind of give out this idea. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be, in, I want to be a PT. I want to be in sports. I want to, you know, what, you know whatever it is. And then we, we do this really cool exercise where we interview them in a few years. So they we kind of like, you know, it's 10 years from now, we kind of interview, so what, what's going on in the last 10 years? Ask them questions, where they got, how, you know, how they get there, are they married, or do they have kids? And it kind of gets a really kind of transition their thought of, I'm a kid, to I got to start thinking about um, what I'm doing. So I think the focus of prevention 
you know, certainly should include some data and awareness. I, I don't think it should include scare tactics, and I think it really needs to focus on on life direction or goals and the steps to, the steps for healthy living curriculum that uh, Mrs. Berkowitz oversees. You know, really is a comprehensive um, curriculum that finds the, that, that proper balance between knowledge, awareness, and goal setting, and intrapersonal development. Um, the other thing that I think, and, and I don't have it, I don't have the answer to this, so I'm kind of throwing it out here. That's why I decided I'm going to throw it out, and, and maybe we can together collectively figure this out. But I definitely think that we need to carefully start profiling students to create an opportunity to to discover strengths and confidence that doesn't include academics. Because if you look at if you look at if you look at the makeup of what makes an addict, and Patrick Harns, uh, you know, um, who is the leader in sex addiction, he has this incredible model of the making of a sex addict. And he can really kind of like go step by step and say, okay, this is this person has the makeup of a sex addict. And I think that if we look at the statistics, I think it's possible to create that type of model for for this, and I think there needs to be a collaboration between organizations, mental health professionals, schools, um, shul rabbanim. But I think that if there's a way to create some sort of profile to create to, to present kids with opportunities to really develop strengths and meaning outside of the academic world, um, I think that would go a, lot, a long way. Um, so here are some possible. Um, some possible ideas of how to create that profile. And first of all, we know that genetics, there's been a ton of research, and Beth and I have talked about this in the past, there's been tons of research about genetics um, with, 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 their comes, with regards to addiction. Um, and there certainly is a genetic component with both addiction and natural impulses for drugs and its reaction to the body um, the likelihood of, and the likelihood of using it again. Um, there's some really, if you, you can probably Google them and find the really interesting brain imaging between addicts and non-addicts, and the addict's brain on drugs, and how it looks so similar to a normal brain on drugs. So it's some interesting stuff there. Um, I think we, lo we look at some of the familial environmental stuff. Um, kids who come from dysfunctional home environments, with maybe there's a lack of supervision, uh, and, other, and, other, um, and, and, and other risk factors when it comes to what's going on at home. There's drug and alcohol abuse at home. You know that's something. You know that's something to look at. You know if we know, and this this is, this is the hardest part because a lot of times we don't know on, until they start seeking treatment. But if we do know of, of a trauma, whether physical, sexual, psychological, emotional traumas, um, you know I think that that becomes a criteria. And then, and then we look at academic and social challenges. Ten percent of, of A students smoke pot. But 48% of D and F students smoke pot. So if you think about that, that's that's crazy. 48, almost half of the student body who are getting D's and F's will smoke pot at some point during high school. Um, so I think we need to focus, and this is really this really is Madrigos' mission, is to focus on prevention, create some sort of enrichment program for those that we feel are at risk. Like the true at risk, not you know what people call at risk, who are risked, um, and then intervention, helping helping kids, helping families heal from um, heal from heal from the the grasp of addiction, of the self defeat that a lot of kids and families feel. So I think if you know if, if we're able to focus on those three things: prevention, enrichment, and intervention. And like I said, that really is the, the mission of Madrigos. Then I think we're, we'll we'll do a good job. And I'll, and I'll say this: you know, with regard to with regard to I know um, Mr. Lowe is going to speak, and he's representing Footprints of Recovery. The fact that so many treatment programs are out there marketing just to the Orthodox community, programs out in, in, in on the West Coast, Florida, but I'm talking about programs in Arizona, programs in Mississippi, in Texas, West Virginia. I get uh, uh, Wisconsin, right? There are programs that I, you know, that market directly to the Orthodox community because they realize that there really is a niche market there for their treatment. 
Um, so kind of let all that sink in um, and figure out ways. There are, there are people who are going to be addicts, and that's just how there is. The addiction is never, you know, there's, like I said, addiction has been around for a long time. But if we were able to help some kids who maybe have addiction genetics and have addiction tendencies find healthier ways of pushing themselves into the other direction, um, I think that's part of um, the battle. All right. I've always wanted a mic drop. Can I have a mic drop? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jakob Lowe was born and raised in Chicago, and he has on his resume, it says mostly. I'm not quite sure what that means. I think he was mostly, okay. Anyway, he graduated in 2010 with a dual bachelor's degree from Hebrew Theological College in Psychology and Judaic Studies. He served in the IDF from 2011 and 2013, through 2013 in the Givati Infantry Unit. Uh, his, he interned at Harkov Behavioral Hospital on the west side of Chicago in the Adult and Child Psychiatric Stabilization Wards. He graduated in 2016 from Roosevelt University with a master's degree in clinical psychology, and he is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Illinois. He has been working as the lead intake assessor and case manager as well as a counselor at Footprints to Recovery, a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center in Arlington Heights since 2016. Determining appropriate placement and treatment programs, PHP, IOP, or OP, as well as facilitating psychoeducational processes and mental health groups. Uh, Yago? I'm not, I'm not calling it Mr. Lowe. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Always fun. My sister always gets to speak at these kind of things. Awesome. Um, so, a little bit about what I do. Um, I conduct with two other case managers and clinical intake coordinators all the intake assessments on patients coming into treatment at our rehab facility called Footprints to Recovery. We're now in Arlington Heights, Illinois. We are also opening up another facility in Elgin. We have a, uh, one in Pittsburgh, one in New Jersey, one in Arizona, one in Colorado, and I think they're opening up a couple more. Um, the, opioid problem, the opioid epidemic is just continuing to grow, and I guess that's good for business. Um, we offer three levels of care. We offer PHP, IOP, and OP, which is partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, as well as OP, which is outpatient. It just means how many hours you're really there a day. Most of my patients range in age, I'll say the majority of my patients, range from 18 to 30 years old. I have a large group of older adults, 30 to 60, a couple in their 60s and 70s, and one 80-year-old. The 80-year-old, actually, she broke her hip when she was 60. Um, as Mrs. Seleski was saying, the doctor prescribed her opiates for about eight years before finally saying, oh, I think this is a problem, and cut her off. At which point, she kept abusing opiates, her grandchildren pushed her into treatment, she got clean for about five or six years, and then turned to alcohol, and is now there for alcohol rehabilitation. The primary reason people are in treatment at our center is for opiate abuse. Um, we have a lot of people there for cocaine, for benzodiazepines, for alcohol, and other substances, but the primary reason, I'd say 70% of people there, are there for opiate abuse. The nice part about speaking less is a lot of stuff already got covered, and we talked about the 72,000 people a year who die from opioid, uh, who die from overdoses. That's 200 people a day, just for those of us who aren't so good at math. Um, we talked about Norco, Vicodin, Oxycodone, Roxycodone, Percocet, Dilaudid, and heroin, fentanyl, carfentanil. Carfentanil is also known as rhino and elephant tranquilizer. So when you mix that with heroin, you have a very, very uh, bad effect. At the end of October, if I remember correctly, the number for overdoses this year were 68,151. So we've got two months left and 4,000 about. If there's 4,000 more deaths, we'll have matched last year. It's expected to surpass 72,000 this year. I didn't really think that opioid abuse occurred in the Orthodox Jewish community 
the most eye-opening experience for me was my first Orthodox Jewish patient. Uh, let me just check my notes. 28-year-old male from New York, married for five years, two children, and had, abusing, had been abusing opiates for three years. His wife had absolutely no idea. The only reason she found out is he moved from one suburb of New York to another. He needed a new dealer. His dealer cut his whatever he was buying with something and he had a horrible reaction, went to the hospital. They did a drug test, his wife found out. No one at work knew about it, no one in the show knew about it, no one anywhere knew anything about it, and I didn't know about it either um, until he came in. And that's one of the reasons why I'm glad that I get to speak today and share a little bit of my experience and also a couple of stories with you. If you think the problem doesn't exist in the community, I want to share with you a few stories, one of which was told to me quite recently by a former patient of mine who's now in treatment, uh, as I talked about, down in Florida at a sober living, uh, kosher sober living. Um, he explained to me in great detail how his wife was very suspicious. Every time he went out to go get gas, that's when he would pick up. So instead, what he did is he texted his drug dealer on Friday afternoon and had his drugs delivered to him in Shul on Shabbos, right? And he said it was one of the lowest points of his addiction, but he learned this from another addict, another Jewish addict that he had met in treatment who explained to him how to do it the right way. So another eye-opening experience for me. There's also this idea of the stigma in the Jewish community. Um, people are worried about what our family is going to say when they hear that my son, daughter, husband, niece, nephew, whoever it is, is in rehab. And it's extremely difficult to deal with. When someone's missing from shul or synagogue for a week, two weeks, okay, they had a bar mitzvah, they had a wedding, they were out of town, but three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, it becomes very difficult for someone to explain where they are. And they can't say, oh, they're in rehab, because what does that say about them? So I've actually had a wife trying to pull her husband out of treatment because she couldn't deal with the stress of every week going to show and having to deal with, where's your husband? I thought he was here. Oh, he's on a business trip in Florida, always on a business trip in Miami, always on a business trip in all these different places. Every week it was a new excuse, and she actually came to treatment one day saying, he's done with treatment, I can't keep dealing with this, people asking me. She was willing to risk his life due to that strain of having to, like, deal, with the, having to deal with the community. Another issue that I deal with is um, families who think that their son or daughter or whoever it may be, because they're Jewish and because maybe they're more educated sometimes, they're not the same as every other addict in treatment, which is very not true. I had recently another Jewish patient who came in and his parents were so worried about how is this going to affect him finding a study partner? How is this going to affect him finding a wife? They really believed that just you know, staying and learning all day and having a good wife would cure him of his addiction. Um, forget the fact that he was coming to us from his third detox in that month. Uh, he had been found unconscious in the streets twice, uh, actually by, former, by members of an AA group who were getting let out of their meeting. Um, he had stolen thousands of dollars from his parents and from Scholes, from the, from the charity boxes, to support his habit. But for them, that wasn't an issue. The issue for them was, how is this going to affect his future and how is this going to affect you know, him being like, involved in the Jewish community? So educating his family was extremely difficult. Um, like I said before, they thought their kid was better than everyone else. He wasn't like the average person in addiction. And I think what has been mentioned before also applies. It doesn't start... I've, I won't say it doesn't start. It very rarely happens that a patient comes in and says, I started shooting heroin when I was 18. Every once in a while that will happen. But usually it's, I started stealing alcohol from my parents or from my school or from my friend's parents 
at the age of 14, and then I started smoking weed at 16, and then I used a little cocaine at 17, and then I move up the chain. It starts usually with alcohol. That's usually what I see, or that's the first substance they experiment with. And if they have a co-occurring mental disorder, so they're anxious, they're depressed, they have a history of trauma, this helps them feel better, or it helps them numb the pain. So if alcohol numbs the pain so well, opiates are going to numb it even better. Um, so it's very hard to educate families on, and this, the community in general on where it's starting. Um, there is a way to prevent it, and we just have to be careful with what we're exposing children to at a younger age. I think there's also a stigma that older adults don't abuse opiates. And it was talked about before, but I'll talk about it again. My 80-year-old, for example, that I have right now in treatment, she started abusing pain pills at the age of 60. I have a lot of people, patients over the age of 40 who are addicted to pain medication. Um, and heroin, fentanyl, carfentanil as well. M many of them started using what the doctor prescribed them. So they get prescribed, they have a hip replacement surgery, they break a leg, break a kneecap, their doctor starts prescribing them pain medication, the pain medication runs out. The doctor won't refill it after a certain amount of times, and they start to look for alternatives. Um, pills that are bought off the street from talking to my patients are extremely expensive and it's extremely risky. You never know what you're buying. Pill presses are pretty easy to get a hold of, and you can press anything into any shape. So you might think you're buying a Percocet and you're buying a Xanax. You may think you're buying a Vicodin and you're buying fentanyl. Um, there's no guarantee what you're buying is legitimate. And especially older individuals don't want to run the risk of being arrested or like wandering around a CVS trying to find someone with a prescription that they're trying to fill. Heroin is relatively cheap for especially in Illinois and in Chicago on the west side. You can buy a day's worth of heroin for about $30. A Percocet would cost the same for one pill. You don't need to use an IV. You don't need uh, a spoon and uh, you know, a lighter. You can just stick it in your nose and you'll be high and pain free the entire day. Um, so a lot of the patients, my older patients, don't usually start with heroin, but they're there now. Like I mentioned before, the treatment that we do is similar to most mental health treatment. Um, we focus on tools the patients can use to help them deal with their emotions instead of um, having the need or feeling the need to use drugs. The majority of my patients are dual diagnosis, meaning they have a mental health disorder as well as a substance abuse issue. So someone with PTSD may be using opioids to deal with their emotional pain. And the person with anxiety or depression may be using you know, heroin to get high because when they're high, they don't feel depressed or they don't feel anxious anymore. So it's something that anyone in the mental health field really has to be on the lookout for their patients. If your patient all of a sudden had, was having severe depression you know, two weeks ago and you haven't prescribed any medication or nothing's changed, but all of a sudden they come into your office and nothing's wrong, that's a pretty big you know, red flag that you should be aware of. Um, do people here know about sober living homes? Okay. Sober living homes um, are a place where people in recovery and individuals seeking sobriety can live in treatment or after treatment in order to maintain their sobriety. Many of these homes require a drug tests at least once or twice a week and a strict set of regulations, including AA meetings, NA meetings. Um, they usually also require that you are employed and that you're working with a sponsor, all within a short time of moving in. The reason for this is, is that they figure they keep you busy, they keep you accountable, you'll stay sober. But, as Yankee mentioned, there are no sober living programs here in Illinois that I'm aware of that cater just to... Uh, Jewish patients. There are programs in Florida and there are programs in California that I refer patients to. They have detox, residential, and sober living facilities just for 
uh, Orthodox patients. Chabad has one out in California. It's called the Chabad Treatment Center. They really do everything. So <laughs> it's, it's there, and I've spoken to a lot of the staff there. When I refer patients there, when they're referring patients back to us, I've had patients go to California for treatment and then come back and continue treatment with us. The person that I spoke to there said that they are stacked to the brim there. They have no room for more patients. They are expanding their program. We are expanding our program. Um, the place that I sent uh, several of my patients to in Florida, they're expanding their program as well. When I last spoke to one of my patients down there, he said there were 17 men living in his sober living home, all Orthodox. They have their own minion there every day. They don't have to go out to a show like they used to. Um, and they're adding another house because they just don't have enough room right now. Um, Is sober living more affordable than treatment facilities? Yes. Yeah. How's it funded? Yeah. Yeah. Sober living, sober living can cost anywhere from eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month because you're paying the like, rent. Treatment, private pay is several thousand dollars. Is there is there public funding for them in other states? I don't know. Is there oversight? Because I've heard that there are a lot of sober living that there's a lot of issues with getting drugs in. And is there any kind of oversight for the sober living? Sober livings, most of them are privately owned. So whoever's running the house is the one providing the oversight. There are some sober livings. My company, for example, the, the company I work for, Footprints, we have our own sober living for everyone in treatment, and we do encounter those problems, patients bringing drugs into the sober living as well. No matter what sober living you're in, there's always going to be an issue of someone trying to bring drugs in. It's because there's a population of people there who want to buy drugs or have used drugs in the past, so you have a marketplace for it. Um, but yeah, we have, we have a... Our treatment center is on Arlington Heights. We're opening up another one in Elgin pretty soon just because the need is there and um, it's extremely, extremely, it's an extremely, not, I want to say profitable, but like it's continuing to grow and where there's money, there's room for people to continue opening treatment centers. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is, even though it was mentioned before, education on substance abuse, threats don't work. You can threaten someone, and half my patients are on probation. They will go to jail if they use drugs or alcohol one more time. And that doesn't scare them. Right? They can go to jail and continue to get high, especially in Cook County. You can get anything you want in Cook County jail. It's sort of a joke. But that doesn't scare them. Right? Educating kids when they're younger on the dangers of it and having... We have patients who have been sober for a year or two, and they go around to schools in Arlington Heights and Wheeling and Buffalo Grove, and they speak to the students there about how their lives turned out because of what they did. That's not a threat. That's just education. I think education is the most important part in preventing um, this problem to, con to continue to spread. That's all I got. Thank you, Yako. Thank you, Beth and Mimi and Yaki. And so we will now open up for anybody have any questions? Do I have to request uh, anyone? Or? Okay, so uh, my open question is I'm wondering at the moment um, there really weren't too many stories about Jewish women or kosher women. Where do you send kosher women who want to work on, on their addiction? There are certainly um, there are certainly women who are struggling with addiction. Um, a lot of you know, I know in Beit Shua in LA, there's a whole men's division and a whole women's division. Um, with that being said, statistically, um, people going to women going to treatment, um, drugs or alcohol, opiates isn't the primary thing bringing them in, um, but it's you know, typically um, part of their eating disorder. Uh, part of um, other um, factions that they're kind of struggling with. Um, I know Timberline Knowles, actually, just in preparing for this, Timberline Knowles, which is not too far from here, 
um, fantastic facility is only for women, and they, and they really treat um, eating disorders, but they also are treating a lot of um, drug addiction. Um, and they actually have a whole, they actually have a whole article on their, um, on their website about um, orthodox um, drug addiction. So, that's part of that. Um, that being said, it's um, uncommon for a new sober living facility or a new treatment center to um, make space for women. Um, usually they uh, open for men first. Um, even in a place like Beit Shiva is not a kosher facility. Um, although obviously they will work with um, any client to, to meet their needs. Um, Tickle Knowles, um, it's yeah, it's uh, it's unclear exactly what most treatment centers will do for Orthodox um, clients, both religiously, um, traditionally, culturally. Um, it, it's a it's an area of tremendous need, and when you drill down even further into what women need, because there are issues there with um, issues of childcare and accessibility, it's a desperately underserved population. I have to say, desperately, desperately underserved. Yanke, I really liked how you started your presentation with in memory of people that have been lost to um, overdose. And I was wondering, do you do that intervention when you're in schools? I know we don't use scare texts. I just thought it was so powerful, like if you're doing some educational or outreach or team building, if you ever do that, because it would be awesome. That really wasn't my question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, I, I will I will use stories, um, and you know sometimes if somebody says something that I've heard before from one, especially one of those people, I'll share that with them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll use some stories just you know maybe you can learn something from it. Um, you know one one of the names that I one of the names I listed. So he was doing some other job. And this is this is something he was uh, he was. <coughs> Uh, 15 years old, and you know he, he was he had some other he, he, you know he was dealing with some depression and he was doing um, he was smoking a lot of pot, but he was also at that point progressing to uh, to other drugs. But um, but his his main drug of choice was pot, and he um, jumped off his father's balcony, um, holding his bong. So you know when guys tell me that you know pot isn't so bad. Um, that's a story I would share with them. I just thought that in memory of the piece was just exceptionally sure. powerful without being like a scare tactic, without being a scare tactic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear. Just think about it, okay. it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you all um, for your presentation. Um, I'm a safe patient advocate and I do a lot of work in Washington, D.C. And I don't know if you're aware that the FDA just approved a new, even more powerful opioid. So um, if you guys want to check at some point, this, you know, we need to be addressing this because um, it's going to be more powerful than what's currently out there. And it's somehow going to be gotten illegally. So I think we all need to be aware and look at the voting records of certain Congress people regarding their connections to this, because it's scary. That I, I was stunned, quite frankly, to see that with everything that's been going on with the opioid crisis, that this drug came out. So just we need to be aware. Thank you. Can I ask, um, when, when police officers use Narcan or some of those things, do they, does it matter if it's, if it's like a fentanyl or does it matter what type of uh, overdose it is or can they use those for any type of, of overdose? Either so, I mean, well, it's for, they're for opioids specifically. Um, what uh, can make a difference is how many doses are required. So one dose of Narcan can be effective for your typical heroin overdose, for example. 
but for fentanyl they may need four doses. And part of the difficulty there is that first responders may not have as many doses as they need to bring back an individual. Also, not all police departments uh, carry it anymore. My wife is a police officer at Northwestern University. She told me, she asked me uh, last week if I could put her in touch with an organization that I work with called It For Lolly that does uh, Narcan naloxone training for universities. They actually did it when I was at Roosevelt University, they did Narcan training. Uh, all the patients that we have are trained to now use Narcan and are given Narcan. Hopefully not for themselves, but if they're going to be around other people, you know, they may need it. But she explained to me that there were two overdoses at a Northwestern University football game two weeks ago, and that they did not have Narcan. They had to wait for Evanston Fire Department, who were luckily there already, to administer Narcan, because the Evanston Police Department and the Northwestern Police Department don't carry it on them. Do you think the ODs are going to remedy that problem? Like, they, they didn't have it? Like, will that change anything? Will that change it? Sure. It's a cost issue. Um, it's also, you need to be trained. You don't really need to be trained. That's not extensive training. But there is training involved. Um, it's also a risk for the police officers, like was mentioned before. Fentanyl and car fentanyl, they can be absorbed through the skin. So, and I think 0.2 milligrams is a lethal dose. So it's something so small, you can sometimes not even see it. If someone is passed out and you give them CPR, you may overdose as well. So it's just extremely dangerous for, search, for first responders. And there have been stories of uh, police officers or EMTs who have responded to calls, picked up a patient, put them on the journey, and then on the way to the hospital will not out and crash the ambulance because they overdosed or they're passing out or they're high. So it is a really big issue. Um, so a question about marijuana use, because it sounded like you were saying, um, um, Rabbi Greenberger, that there is a correlation between the rise of marijuana and leading to heroin addiction. I, I, that's what it sounded like to me. So um, I've just talked to a lot of people about marijuana. And you know, the kids that you talk to are like ridiculous. Adults are getting all upset about nothing. Marijuana is no big deal. It's not an entry drug. I know people who use marijuana recreationally their whole life, and they're perfectly fine. So I would just like to you know, hear more about how addictive marijuana is and how often it leads to a more serious opioid addiction. So I'm a big enemy of marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, I'll, what, I'll tell, what I'll tell kids a lot of times, if you, if you personify pot, I was going to steal my thunder here, so you say, wait, you can get If you personify pot, you give pot personality, what type of person would you be? And, and, you know, basically, if, if the person who is your best friend is really funny, right, he likes to go out and eat, and um, he's always there for you, you can always count on him. Um, but at the end of the day, the first opportunity he has to mess you over and stab you in the back, he's going to do it. So that's kind of like the, 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 that's kind of the personification of pot that I like to share with kids. I've heard that a lot also, um, that oh, I know so many adults who are millionaires and they're smoking pot, right? Yeah. So, for, so first of all, the first thing I, I, I challenge them is when do they start? Right? When do they start smoking pot? Did they really start when they were 15? Did they really start when they were 17? Or did they start well, you know, when they were older? And there is, that, there is a growing trend of adults who are starting to smoke pot because, it, you know, because it, it's, it's, a, you know, it's available, it's not so bad. You can get, you know, e-cigs, they have something called a pen, right? So there's, there, there's the e-cig, there's the jewel, um, there's the vapor, and then there's something called a pen. The pen is basically pot. So anyone who's smoking a pen is pot. And I know, I know of adults, successful businessmen, who keep a pen in their pocket and will pull it out from time to time throughout their day and smoke a little bit. And 
basically be high all day. Now, I think at some point, even for those people who have that really intense relationship with pot, eventually it's going to progress. It may take a little longer than it does with the kids, but I definitely think that there are, I definitely think that there is a correlation between pot and alcohol um, abuse in teenagers and then progressing to other drugs. Now it could be with, with the mental illness, but if, so, if someone you know, really has an undiagnosed anxiety disorder, so they may not go to opiates, they may go to benzodiazepines, right? But there is that kind of like sedative calming effect that pot has that is, it's, it's a great solution to a problem that they have of anxiety. So at some point it starts where, you know, it kind of like wears <coughs> out. So those, uh, some of those folks may move to, uh, you know, Xanax, um, Ambien, and some of the other residents things available. But I definitely think that there's a correlation, and anyone who tells me differently, let's go. Do you have a question on that class as well? Um, thank you for your talk. Um, one thing I want to add that sometimes sheds a little light is that it's pretty hard to overdose on marijuana. So in that regard, people think it's safer and can really generalize that idea that marijuana is safe because it can't kill you in that way. Um, well, yes, unless you're driving a car. But it was overdose. Um, so it's, it's tricky in that way because we're so, we're so focused, rightfully so, on drugs that will kill you on first use. Right? Um, so marijuana is more insidious in that way. And what about its addictive properties? Clearly it is. There's Marijuana Anonymous. It's a 12-step program. It's really busy up in Mount Park. It's full of Jews. <laughs> because, you know, I'll have kids say to me, oh, only some people can become addicted to marijuana. Well, Not that's other true. people. Almost every drug. Alcohol. Right. It's, and there are, there are certain pieces of addiction that are still mysterious. We don't know why some people can just put a drug down and walk away after using it for 20 years. And never pick it up again, and some people who relapse and relapse and relapse and relapse and die. There are some things we just don't fully, fully understand because the brain is that complex, and drugs are that complex. Um, I think this is in some ways related to what we were just talking about. I've heard a lot about <clears throat> doctors now turning to medical marijuana to help control pain, um, to help people either get off of or not turn to opiates um, because of some of the, the, the properties that you said. It's not as, as immediately dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. How, what are feelings about that? We run a medical clinic. We don't write paperwork for medical marijuana. Um, many of the people who come in to see our psychiatrists with dual diagnosis, I would say most are doing marijuana if they're alongside all the drugs that our uh, psychiatrist is giving them to control their other symptoms. So what is working for the patient, marijuana helps. How would they know that? How would you know which one is working? So is it um, something that the art feels would be useful for controlling pain? No, it's just another complication in a really complicated world. What you're describing, Susan, is a, a very straightforward harm reduction approach. So you're looking at, is something going to kill you, or is something going to not kill you? You know, in the broadest strokes imaginable. Mm -hmm. We're looking for ways to reduce the harm of somebody's use. And if using medical marijuana, it's the, it's the harm reduction philosophy. If using one drug or using it in a particular way will reduce the harm of drug use overall, then that's, per, that's a perceived benefit. The end goal with harm reduction usually also is abstinence. The, the goal ultimately is somebody is, has a clean and sober lifestyle. But I think that's, that speaks to um, the philosophy uh, behind that kind of decision. Just to, just to add one more thing to that, I think that. Um, so if, if, uh, if someone has cancer and they have you know, some other things that you know, marijuana has really shown um, some positive effects, if you need an appetite um, enhancer, you know, some you know, pain relief, um, 
you know, we're, we're not to say don't smoke pot, don't do that stuff. I think it, I think it, it gets very dangerous. And, you know, at the same time, I you know when I was in LA, now now it's recreational, recreationally legal, but there was it was, it was marijuana was legal there, and there was a doctor on Melrose. I forgot her name. It was, a, it was a woman doctor that a lot of the guys that I worked with used to go to her, right? And say my toenail hurts. Oh, here's my some here's some right. So you have to you have to find you have, you have to. I think we have to also look at. I'm not. Uh, I don't. I don't know the whole bureaucracy behind why we can't get uh, medical marijuana built in pharmacies versus you know, you know also whatever, whatever your federal law all that stuff. All that, stuff. Um, that being said, also there, you know. What, when I had the discussion about medical marijuana with, with teenagers, so there's a lot of medicinal marijuana that doesn't have the psychoactive ingredient of delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is what gets people high. So, so there are oils, there are there are you know um, creams and other stuff that have marijuana part that really enhance things. So I thought if you if you're really sick and you need something, so go ahead. That, but it's not going to get you high. But it costs a lot. Okay. There you go. Right. Okay. I had a question about the treatment facilities. It sounds from what I'm listening that there's quite a few programs that cater to the Orthodox <coughs> community, California, Florida, Arlington Heights, and all that. Is that in proportion with the rest of the world? Is that we're maybe addressing it in the Orthodox community? Or why would that be if we're technically such a small population of the United States? <clears throat> and, and when we're being the boys versus the men versus the women, like it sounds like this, there's a lot more going on. Yankees' names were all male names. I didn't hear one female name in there, so I was just curious. Oh, because I just I work primarily with with men, with okay. boys. Yeah. So I was just yeah. curious about those two. Also, the facility on the nice does not cater to uh, Jews or Orthodox Jews in general because the owner of the company is Jewish. I have dealt with a lot of Jewish patients that have been referred to the facility. I actually have what's called a map, it's the kosher corner, which is on my grocery toaster oven. That just, like, I get to use it every day, it's fantastic. I bought it just for the Jewish patients. But like, it's in my office because we've had patients who, who, need, to, who need that one bit there. Um, and all the Jewish patients that I've had have all been male. I have not once yet had a female uh, Orthodox Jewish patient come my way. I have met them. They deny that they have an issue, but they definitely are there. I haven't yet had a chance to treat them. And treatment centers, though, across the United States that do cater to Orthodox Jewish people, how does that correlate with the numbers? Like, does that mean that maybe the Orthodox community is recognizing it and quietly addressing it? Yep. Or there's still a lot more need for addressing it? I don't think this is exactly what you're asking, but this is what I have to give, so this is what I'll give you. Um, treatment programs are developed when there's a population that can use them, right? So we can consider that there must be enough Orthodox folks who are able to afford the care, who are, um, where the care is accessible to them, and that they're being referred. So there are other segments of the American population that don't have insurance to cover, that um, are welcomed or don't find it accessible. So that's just one piece of the puzzle, but it must be a significant piece that there's a lot of treatment programs being um, offered specifically for the Orthodox community. That means that there's enough of the Orthodox community that can afford and get to and take advantage. So, what can we do to be helpful to people who are experiencing addiction or might experience addiction? What, what can your average person do? Yeah. <laughs> 
So, I think, this, I think the statistic is, and we're really good really with these studies and numbers. I think this, this stat is 82% of people that feel they have family support succeed in treatment. So, now whether somebody actually has family support or not, I think that if they could feel as if they have family support and they're not being judged, they're not being um, thought of as, you know, damaged goods or anything, you know, that there's something wrong, but other than they're struggling with, uh, with, with a disease that's not unlike diabetes or unlike, um, you know, whatever other disease you want to think about, um, and, and just feel, you know, and, and give over that compassion and not judging them and, you know, um, be able to help them without enabling, help them um, with creating um, some movement towards treatment, whether it's going with them to an open AA meeting um, or any meeting, um, going to check out a facility, they're, they're kind of thinking about it. Um, but I think that the real sense is support. And it, it, it sounds cliche, it sounds kind of like that's it. But yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, at the end of the day, the pain of using drugs has to outweigh the pain of not using drugs. So, you know, without enabling and helping get to that point, I think that, that's with support and love and not judging, that's a really cool thing to do. I'll say the same thing. It's about providing support and not being judgmental or not pushing them to do something when they're not ready. If someone is forced into treatment, <clears throat> they most likely will not succeed. If someone is being forced there by their probation officer, by their family, because otherwise they won't have a place to live, they'll go through the motions and they'll do 30, 60, 90 days, whatever they're required to do. And then as soon as they're done, they'll go back to whatever they were doing because they're out of whatever form of trouble they may have been in or they're fulfilling whatever sort of obligation they have to do. Um, and yeah, like, like you said, just taking them off and pay. You want to go check out the treatment center. You want to go to a meeting with me. I'll drive um, because usually they won't be able to drive. And another big part is when you're being supportive, don't make, um, don't diagnose them in your head and don't be like, don't. I've had families come in and say, oh well, he you know does so much cocaine and he uses so many opiates, and it's because of this one time in high school he got beat up. If you sort of have an idea or you think you have an idea of why it's happening and it's not that idea, you're going to have a really hard time when they find out that they're using drugs for a different reason. Well, one more thing to add to these really important points. Um, since we at um, Jewish Center for Addiction work at community level, there are things we can do as communities, as a Jewish community. What we can do is be open, that we can strive to create communities where our members can come forward with their vulnerability, and that's probably every one of us, because we all are vulnerable in lots of ways and suffer um, in a variety of ways, and we all need safe places where we feel like we can show up with our difficulties and our pain and our dysfunction and be received with open arms. And it's my own personal experience with the Jewish community in general terms is not a particularly psychologically safe place to show up in our messes. Um, the reason that it's so important to create safe communities, um, community of the big C and the community of all the little C's, all of our synagogues, all of our organizations, um, is because the sooner somebody feels like they can come forward in safety and say, I need help, the sooner they'll get help. The earlier somebody with addiction gets help, the better chances that they'll live. So, and that's true of depression and other mental illness. So as welcoming and open, as much discussion as we can have, as much stigma as we can reduce, will directly save lives. So it's an individual issue to be supportive and open. It's a family issue to have the discussions. But it's also a communal issue to be looking at our, every place that we are active in our own Jewish communities and create safety for people to come forward and to feel that we ourselves can come forward. That's probably a pretty good gauge of our community. So we're not, we feel that we can bring our mess to our clergy and to our members. You're one because David's in just now. David, one, we have two or three questions. David's in. David said yes. 
I think there's a, there's a, a it's wonderful to see so many hands up, and I hope that our speakers will be able to stay for a few minutes. So this isn't the end of the conversation, but for the purpose of the of the of the um, open part of the meeting, the public part of the meeting, we're going to be wrapping up. Okay, I want to I want to thank Ed and the panelists. Um, really fantastic. Morning. I do want to note that uh, Beth Fishman played an integral role in putting this whole thing together. And as we went through the panelists, I really felt in many ways that we were peeling back an onion, um, really just going from a little bit deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and stories that each one of you shared was really um, um, quite incredible. And I think the, the real life stories, the real life experiences that make all the difference in the world in making this really not a clinical issue, but really making it an issue that we're all dealing with. And I know that everyone in this room um, is affected and working uh, with, within this topic, and I think there's a lot for all of us to learn, and I feel there's a lot for all of us to share as well. Um, the panelists will be available afterwards, so please stick around. We're going to have some networking. Um, a couple of notes. Um, first of all, you have the evaluation forms. We really do take them very seriously. We need them to help figure out what our next forums are going to be. We do three forums every two years, so the next one will be announced soon. It'll probably, it'll almost certainly be in the spring, um, and we'll get that out to everybody uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, if you want more information about the Orthodox Network, it's, network itself, please speak with David, with Emeril, and myself, or any one of us here who are, are, are on the um, on, on the form on the committee. Uh, if you stepped out during the presentation and took one of the pass cards. Please return it. We, we need those things. Um, and that closes the public part of today's forum. We have the room until 11 o'clock, so please stick around, eat some food, speak with the panelists, and have a good day. Thank you.